I would like to start by welcoming every, everybody to this week's Hanover seminar. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, present Ty Taylor and Valeria Ivanov, who are gonna give a presentation today, um, uh, focusing on eco-hydrological questions in the Amazon. Um, so yeah, I think that, I don't know exactly where to start, but I've known both of these uh, characters for uh, quite a while. Um, in large part because we're all collaborators on some projects um, focused at the Tapajos National Forest and um, in, in the central Brazilian Amazon. Um, I've gotten to know Valeri working at that site actually. Um, and Ty I've actually known for, for longer than that. I met Ty I think first in 2006 in Costa Rica when he was uh, finishing his um, research project that he had started as an undergraduate and I was, uh, I should say, an undergraduate at, at Evergreen College um, to give a little bit of his background. Um, and I was quite, quite impressed because he was actually self-funding, figuring, finishing up this project that involved climbing trees and sampling soils in the, in the forest canopy um, because he was so interested in it. And he was getting his self-funding from working in the, the oil fields in the northern slope of Alaska and then coming down to Costa Rica to finish up his project and climb trees. Um, so, um, so I was quite happy when he actually ended up joining the same lab that I was doing my PhD in um, a few years later at the University of Arizona. Um, so yeah, to, so Ty is uh, from, um, from Alaska, um, from Fairbanks and went to school in Evergreen and then came to the University of Arizona um, after that, after he got his PhD, he did his postdoc um, in a cool project um, uh, advised by Ken Feely and Alvaro Duque that was split between um, the, the Fairchild Botanical Garden and the uh, National University of Columbia and Medellin's um, Botanical Garden as well, um, looking at um, uh, looking at isoprene production and tree heat stress. He has now actually moved on to doing a postdoc with Valeri, who I'll introduce um, in a second um, at the University of, of Michigan, um, working more on eco-hydrological questions. Um, and I should also add that Ty is uh, a very good friend of MSU Forestry, a, a friend of my lab. He's a close collaborator uh, with me and my student, um, uh, Leonardo Zicardi, and uh, is a close collaborator with Marielle Smith, who is also his overall partner in crime. Um, and so uh, I'm pleased to, to have Ty give this presentation. And let me just also uh, welcome Valeri. Um, Valeri, uh, just to quickly give his background, he um, got his undergraduate um, from the Moscow State University. Um, He's initially from, I was trying to remember yesterday, I asked him, I said, I remember you told me you're from the, the, the Urals. And he said, yes, I'm from the Northern Urals and you can find me by going to 60, 60, 60, uh, 60 West and 60 North. And that's where Valeria is from. Um, so he went on to do a PhD at MIT um, and, uh, and then a, uh, a sorry, um, uh, postdoc at Harvard with Steve Wofsey um, before getting his position at the University of Michigan um, in the, sorry, the Department of Civil Engineering, um, Civil and Environmental Engineering. So he has broad eco-hydrological interests, tropical forest eco-hydrology um, is one of his focuses. He also does a bunch of work in uh, Siberia and other systems as well. So I don't want to take any more time. I should hand it over to you guys. Thank you so much for coming and looking forward to your presentation. All right, thanks, Scott. So um, I will start sharing my slides in a second here and I'll present today, but Valeria will be here to back me up, back me up or call me out or help answer uh, some questions from you guys. So I'll start sharing my screen. Hi, I should say one more thing. Um, I, I do need to let people know that we're recording this session. So if you have your cameras on um, and you don't um, and you don't want to, uh, please turn them off. This will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. Okay, thank you. 
And just real quick, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And then when we get to the end of the presentation, um, Ty and Valeri can answer them. Sorting out my Zoom settings here. There we go. Okay, so then I am going to talk to you today about cascade ecohydromics in the Amazonian watershed system. Uh, ecohydromics is what we're calling, uh, it's, it's analogous to the omics of biology, which are the components that characterize or give rise to the structure and function of biological organisms. And ecohydromics is what we're calling the uh, primary components in the watershed system of ecology and hydrology that give rise to the integrated function of watersheds. And we could sum up my talk by uh, the simple statement that ecosystem models uh, need to be improved and are continually being improved in terms of plant physiology, ecology, and hydrology. And I'm going to go through those first two points very quickly with some uh, published work and segue into the bulk of the talk, which will be on the third point on integrating hydrology into ecosystem models. To start with, this is a paper that just came out that I worked on with Marielle Smith, who's a postdoc in Scott Stark's lab, lab at uh, MSU Forestry. And what we did here was tested whether high temperature photosynthetic declines in tropical forests are primarily uh, caused by temperature directly or by vapor pressure deficit. And uh, this is a difficult question to answer because vapor pressure deficit and temperature are highly correlated in natural systems. Um, and our unique contribution to this question uh, was by using an artificial tropical forest inside of the Biosphere 2 biome in Arizona, which is depicted here in the lower right. So this is a, a pyramidal glass, and glass enclosure containing a tropical forest inside. And in this system, we were able to experimentally achieve very high temperatures and at the same time, very low VPD, vapor pressure deficit, by adding uh, massive amounts of um, water vapor to the air. And in doing that, we were able to observe that Biosphere 2, under these conditions, that forest can, photo can maintain photosynthesis, that's the red line in the left panel, up to very high temperatures compared to natural uh, tropical forests. That's the gold and the blue lines. And this cartoon shows the mechanism um, behind this, uh, this interaction. So uh, under low VPD or low atmospheric water demand, the leaf stomata open, they release water and that allows them to bring in CO2. And then when VPD is high and there's high atmospheric demand for water, stomata close to minimize water loss and then that reduces CO2 entering the leaf and that's what causes photosynthetic decline with increasing VPD like in panel B. So in the future we expect temperatures and VPD to increase because those two are correlated and so you could expect that tropical photosynthesis will decrease under those conditions. But also what will happen in the future is we'll have higher CO2 in the atmosphere and with higher atmospheric CO2, you can actually, uh, this will result in more CO2 entering the stomata relative to the amount of water that is lost. And so this is a mechanism by which uh, forests may be able to sustain photosynthesis even as temperatures and vapor pressure deficit increase. But this can only work if there is a limited direct effect of temperature on photosynthetic biochemistry, which is what we showed with Biosphere 2. But um, this may not be the entire picture. So we know that there are direct high temperature uh, negative impacts on photosynthetic biochemistry. And there's a trait that I've studied a lot, which is the emission of isoprene gas from tree leaves. And this is a trait that's associated with uh, enhanced thermal tolerance of photosynthesis. And we showed in this study on the right that uh, trop among tropical trees, 
species that emit isoprene gas that are capable of doing this photosynthesize to higher leaf temperatures than species that do not emit isoprene. And this is putatively due to the role that isoprene plays in mitigating those direct biochemical impacts from high temperatures. And in this previous study, we actually showed that in Biosphere 2, the site where we did the first study I showed you, um, as the plant community changed through time over a couple of decades of community change, species that do not emit isoprene died more than species that do emit isoprene. So we got a 52% increase in the proportion of trees that emit isoprene in this biome. And this ecological change could have contributed to an increased thermal tolerance of the biome as a whole. And we see this pattern mirrored across space. Um, we, this figure shows the proportion of isoprene emitting trees at a given site uh, relative to the site's mean annual temperature. And as you traverse across temperature gradients in the tropics, you see an increase in the proportion of isoprene emitters toward higher temperatures. Marielle and I worked together to produce these maps estimating the distribution of isoprene emitting leaf area in the Amazon under current climate based on the uh, ecological trends that we observed. And then we projected how that might look under two degrees of warming. And now this assumes that uh, community composition change in response to climate through time will be identical to community composition change in response to climate across space as we observed. But, uh, and that's a big assumption, but nonetheless, this simply illustrates a point that um, ecological responses to climate could change the distribution of physiological responses to climate. In this case, resulting in more leaf area that is more thermally tolerant. So to sum up the needs uh, considerations for ecosystem modeling, we need the correct physiological mechanisms in order to capture responses to future climate, in this case, disentangling temperature from vapor pressure deficit effects. And models also need to account for the ecological responses that can alter the distribution of physiological responses on the landscape. Fortunately, ecosystem vegetation models have been evolving over time, steadily improving as um, summed up or reviewed nicely by Rosie Fisher in this 2018 paper. This depicts a few examples of how different uh, dynamic global vegetation models that run inside of Earth system models manage forest processes. So the physiology has definitely been steadily improving and they can handle, for example, different physiology across multiple light environments. And there are also multiple species as depicted by the different shadings of gray. There are different tree sizes and different uh, developmental stages and they can compete and respond dynamically to their environment and have a community change that reflects you know, a, a, an ecological response um, of the forest to a changing environment. Looking below ground, the hydrology is still fairly simple, um, pretty much a bucket of water with roots in it. And how the water gets there and where it goes is not really of consequence to the vegetation models. Um, and this could be why we, or could be one of the factors contributing to some observed mismatches between uh, models, model predictions and observations. For example, this study uh, showing data from the Kilometer 67 site, which is my virtual background um, in the Eastern Brazilian Amazon, shows that this site has a pronounced dry season <clears throat> that's depicted by the, the gray shading here. And in this dry season, we see that uh, gross primary productivity actually increases as the site gets drier, whereas the <clears throat> the suite of models all predict a decrease in GPP. And then the same, is, same goes for evapotranspiration. We actually see increased transpiration during the dry season, whereas the models are showing a decrease. Now, one of the tricky features of this particular site is that it is on, um, it's on a clay plateau, a high clay plateau. There's a very deep water table but the clay actually retains soil water very well. It binds soil water well. And so what's happening here 
well, one of the uh, explanatory differences here between the models and the observations is that the models are all running out of water. And in the real world, the trees are not. <clears throat> now, Valery Ivanov um, tried a different modeling approach here using a model called T-Ribs Veggie, which is uh, really a different scale of model. It's much more detailed, um, designed to operate at smaller spatial scales than these. Um, but it also has, it's also capable of resolving um, some sophisticated soil hydrology. So he was able to reproduce the clay soil dynamics, including the long-term retention of soil water. Um, although this required resolving some other factors such as um, if all of the trees are drawing water from the surface of the soil, it over dries to the point where it can no longer conduct water. And that means you don't get any infiltration. And he resolved that by, um, in, by incorporating a root niche separation by tree size so that roots at different depths created a heterogeneous distribution of soil water drawdown and that maintained soil water conductivity to the root zones. Um, but basically the point is by, by dealing with the soil hydrological problems, he was able to reproduce the observed increase in transpiration throughout the dry season. Now, uh, being terrestrial organisms, it's easy to understand why we might just uh, try to overlook what's going on below ground. In fact, when you look at the Amazon from a distance, it looks a whole lot like a big leaf sitting in water, which is basically how we modeled it for a long time. But the Amazon has a complex geological history, <clears throat> which gives rise to spatially dynamic topography, and that induces spatial variation in hydrology. The upper Amazon River is basically a large flat floodplain, and the lower river is characterized by these finely dissected plateaus and valleys carved out of this particular geological group, the Alter du Chau uh, formation. And if you zoom in here on one of these, this shows uh, at a very fine spatial scale, this fine dissection that would give rise to, as you can imagine, some um, dynamic hydrology over fine scales. Now we know from hydrological modeling at the large scale <clears throat> that water table depth varies uh, considerably across these zones. In some places, you have very shallow water tables. That's the green line here across a year of time. Um, in this case, the site is sitting here between one and two meters below the surface. And so it doesn't really matter what rain does. It would, it would take a very strong drought for trees to run out of water at this site. What they would actually be more concerned about is when the water table comes up to the surface or above and trees get waterlogged and that impacts their function. Now at some other sites, there's some interesting temporal dynamics like at the headwaters of the Xingu, where you have a very pronounced dry season. And as precipitation falls below 100 millimeters a month, and that's uh, limiting precipitation for evapotranspiration, the groundwater actually has a lag in its decline. And there's still quite a bit of groundwater within the, the root zone for most large trees throughout the majority of that dry season. So you have kind of a decoupling of, of atmospheric water availability and soil, soil water availability to trees. At Kashwana, you have uh, at the peak dry season, as we're entering the peak dry season, uh, the trees are, at least according to this model prediction, starting to run out of groundwater availability unless they have pretty deep roots. Now, if we can harness this hydrological modeling, into ecosystem models, we may be able to resolve some of these model data mismatches. <clears throat> um, but there is, there's still some details to work out. So uh, what we're seeing here is uh, these figures produced by Shuli Chen in Scott Seleska's lab. And she's showing on the top the distribution of the rainfall network of long-term forest monitoring plots, where a lot of the uh, data from the Amazon comes from. And then what's circled is this area of flat floodplain with very shallow water table. That's what's shown on the bottom, the shallow water table. And there's a conspicuous absence of sites there. 
And so this shows that even if we can get the hydrology introduced into ecosystem models, we know very little about how the forest actually responds there. Um, and one of the reasons, that, uh, the likely reason that there are very few plots in these shallow water table sites is because they're very hard to work at. They're muddy and wet. But uh, some of our very brave Brazilian colleagues have established a set of plots uh, along a water table transect um, in, this, in this understudied site led by Flavia Costa and Juliana Schietti. And they, they are starting to build up a good catalog of um, ecological understanding at these sites. And Scott Stark has recently joined them in a grant that is recently funded by the NSF uh, called The Other Side of Drought, where they are looking at the dynamics of uh, water logging and release from um, water logging as uh, the dry season comes along um, and plants can actually gain higher function in high sunlight with sustained water availability. Um, so let's take a look at, at a closer look at hydrology models. So this um, sophisticated hydrology modeling, like in the Miguez Macho and Fan paper on the left, um, tends to treat vegetation as a, a very simple component of the landscape. So it requires vegetation because hy hydrological modeling requires accounting for transpiration forests transpire a substantial amount of the precipitation that hits the ground, they remove it from the system. And so to get the hydrology right, you have to account for transpiration somehow. Most hydrology models use a very simple formulation um, of transpiration, which is just a uniform treatment of biophysics where the atmospheric energetic demand for water uniformly determines how much is coming out of trees. Um, kind of like what's shown here on the right, except that in this right panel, this is uh, the community land models depiction of its uh, hydrology component. And this runs inside the community earth system model. And also in that model is a dynamic vegetation model, which actually does have all the dynamic processes of vegetation that are linked to this hydrology model, instead of the simple treatment as in the modeling on the left. But in this CLM hydrology, the hydrology is actually very simplified. So basically we either have models with complex vegetation and simple hydrology or complex hydrology and simple vegetation. Now, uh, are the, is the hydrology modeling justified in assuming that uh, we can just treat vegetation, especially transpiration as just a uniform process across the landscape? Well, some recent uh, work that's coming out and exploring this uh, this question of how forests behave across these uh, shallow water table depths or valley in this case, compared to deep water table depths forests are showing that they aren't, uh, they are not uniform forests. <clears throat> so in this upper left panel, we see specific leaf area, which is a basic leaf trait that correlates with uh, photosynthetic rates and transpiration rates. And you can see higher specific leaf area in the valleys compared to the plateau. And the tree hydraulic vessel diameters tend to also be higher in the valleys than the plateaus. And that's something that can allow faster transpiration rates, but the trade-off is lower resistance to drought. And this paper by Oliveira 2019 shows uh, a similar metric to what you're seeing in panel D up there. This is, the, uh, this is called P50, which is the, the water potential required to lose 50% of the stem's conductivity. So this is kind of a, <clears throat> a measurement of, of uh, hydraulic strain or drought resistance. Um, in this case, the valleys have this are clustered here. The trees in the valleys have a very limited resistance to hydraulic strain, which is correlated with a higher conductive capacity. Whereas trees on the slopes actually have, or on the plateaus, actually have a very broad distribution, but they come into um, much more hydraulically resistant zones, which also the trade-off is lower conductive capacity. So it looks like we cannot simply treat these as a uniform system. So if, um, if the hydrology is spatially dynamic and if the trees behave differently in these different hydrologic zones, then this is particularly a problem in places like this where you have such a finely distributed distinction of 
plateaus and valleys are shallow and deep water tables. Amigas Macho and Finn provide um, an estimate for this zone and their, their modeling again is at a very coarse scale. And so um, they can only give what's kind of like an average. So they estimate a water table depth of nine to 10 meters, which is probably a pretty good estimate um, for this area as an average. But they would have, this of course does not represent any of the valley dynamics that are here. Now we've zoomed in a little bit um, and what I'm showing here in this inset mapped onto the larger map scale is the output of hand. It's an algorithm that produces the height above the nearest drainage. And this is kind of a quick fix way of getting some hydrological information on the landscape. But it's, it's just a, basically a simple algorithm that is based entirely on topography. So there's no hydrologic process going into this. And of course, it won't be able to capture the temporal dynamics that um, the sophisticated hydrology modeling of Miguez Macho and Fan can do. Um, but it gives us some information. And one thing that they found is that they estimate about 25% of this area has a water table less than five meters. So that obviously wouldn't be captured by the course modeling. <clears throat> so we have a system where forests in the plateau with their unique ecophysiology and unique environments are regulating the water input through subsurface hydrology to forests in the valleys with their unique ecophysiologies and environments. And we have a system therefore where the ecology depends on the hydrology and the hydrology depends on the ecology. So as depicted by this Ouroboros here, if you want to get one of them right or either of them right, you have to model them together. And that is exactly what we plan to do with the proposal that we are uh, close to submitting, which we call Cascade Ecohydromics. So ecohydromics is our fancy made up word um, describing the, the major ecological and hydrological components that give rise to the integrated function of watershed systems. And we call it a cascade system because um, uh, effects propagate in one direction downstream. Now this requires a, a great deal of measurements, a lot of different expertise. And so this is a, a large collaboration that we're putting together. Um, heavily relying on good relationships with um, some established and some new Brazilian collaborators. We're doing this across two sites. And at these sites, we have experts in uh, ecosystem fluxes, ecophysiology, and soil hydrology. And we have three different institutions in the US that we're coordinating across as well. So fortunately at this uh, fascinating site of finely divided plateau valley systems, um, this also happens to be the site of the K34 flux tower and research site, which is home to the only thoroughly hydrologically instrumented watershed in the pristine lowland Amazon. So that will be one of our study sites and uh, to give you, uh, spatially orient you again, that's here near Manaus. And our second study site is uh, called Kilometer 67 here near Santarém. And both of these sites have eddy flux towers for monitoring ecosystem processes. And they are sites of uh, long-term ecological and ecosystem scale research. Now, one of the advantages of incorporating the K67 site is that it sits on top of a broad plateau and this flux tower here actually captures, uh, pretty much isolates the dynamics of the plateau. And that's not something you can do with the flux tower signal at K34 because that signal integrates everything that's going on in plateaus and valleys in the whole system. So this is one of the ways we can start to differentiate those. And there is also happens to be this cute little miniature finely divided watershed that's like a mini version of the K34 area 
that's right near the tower site and we've never studied anything there, but uh, I've explored it on some backcountry adventuring and it looks like an ideal site to, um, to uh, instrument and basically treat it as a miniature replicate of the K34 area to see if we get the same dynamics in trees and, and soils. So I'll give you an overview of, of the study, the proposed work. So objective one, um, actually, I didn't mention the first time that I showed this figure. I'll give an even higher level overview. So uh, our objective of this study is to identify the major components, the ecohydromics that give rise to the function in these uh, watershed systems, um, and quantify all of the major elements that are required to parameterize a model, T-ribs veggie. Um, this model is capable of handing uh, dynamic vegetation, including a diversity of physiological strategies. Um, and it has sophisticated subsurface components that, that can be flexibly developed. So we're going to develop multiple stages of subsurface components of this model. And then we hope to integrate the entire uh, uh, system together into a single unified model that handles the plateau valley dynamics and can reproduce what we see in the watershed. And we're targeting a series of measurements that can quantify all of these components to parameterize each phase of the model and also have targeted measurements that are able to validate the model outputs at each of the scales. So starting with objective one is focusing on above ground ecophysiology. And I'll particular, particularly bring your attention to uh, needing to establish um, species compositions, running long-term sap flow uh, sensors in at least 20 trees per subsite. Uh, we're using the flux towers to validate measurements. And importantly, we're doing a series of leaf gas exchange measurements, establishing the sensitivities of different species to light, temperature, vapor pressure deficit, and CO2, I didn't write in there. And those are uh, the primary things that are required to parameterize the vegetation function in the model. So for the ecophysiology work, um, we'll be doing a lot of work with the LICOR uh, I guess that was the 6400. Now I suppose we'll be using some 6800s as well, hopefully. Um, this is Lauren Albert in a tree in the uh, K67 plateau site in 2012, uh, photos by Neil Prohaska. And Lauren is going to be, she's now a new faculty member at West Virginia University, and she'll be leading uh, the ecophysiology at this site, or at least with a hopeful student that we will get to do that. Um, and then here's Valeri Ivanov, installing some sap flow sensors in trees at the K67 site. And we have about 40 of these already that have been gathering data for a long time. And there are um, some also installed at K34, but we're basically going to fill out the collection so we have some even sampling across each of the uh, sites and subsites. And so this is largely for uh, parameterizing the T-ribs veggie model. And the sap flow data will give us uh, another way of independently validating the estimates of transpiration from the model. Um, also, we can aggregate the sap flow data to estimate some ecosystem scale fluxes, and it can give us a way to scale leaf level parameters across um, changes in stem water potential as, as soil water availability changes. Of course, we'll validate these measurements with uh, ecosystem fluxes. And fortunately, we don't have to do all of our measurements while climbing trees like Lauren was doing in that previous photos because uh, both sites have walk-up towers like this one that give us access to several trees. Uh, here's Neil Prohaska using the LICOR to measure photosynthesis on a uh, Manokara hubri off the walk-up tower. And we have, uh, thanks to Neil Prohaska and Mick Eltringham at our K67 plateau site, we have a series of canopy walkways that give us access to more species. And there are similar walkways in both the plat plateau and valleys at, at uh, K34. Now, how do we deal with the overwhelming diversity of trees at these sites? So in the K67 plateau site, we've identified over 200 species. And we have canopy access to about 20 of them through the towers and the walkways. 
But amazingly, because of the, um, the species abundance distributions, uh, and of course, careful placement of these walkways to capitalize on that, these 20 species give us access to 43% of the basal area of the forest. And that's not an uncommon scenario because um, in, if you look across the Amazon, there are about 16,000 tree species and just 227 of those species make up half of the trees. So the abundance distribution is such that you can measure a relatively few carefully targeted trees and characterize um, a large, uh, a disproportionately large amount of the function of the forest. <clears throat> and it happens that, uh, and this is actually very common, that the dominant species at our site are also hyperdominance across the Amazon. So as we focus on, on scaling in our sites, the species that we will inform could inform function in some of these less studied areas, um, although that of course should be validated. <clears throat> Now I'll uh, show you some stories about two of the conspicuous characters at our site. We really have come to think of the different species as these kind of unique characters. And uh, the different species have these very characteristic behaviors. So these are two of our emblematic characters, Erismo and Sinatum in blue on the left here and Mesilaris itauba. So that's in the Loraceae, that's in the Bochiziaceae, for those of you who are into that kind of thing. And on, the, on this figure on the left, we're showing stem water potential as determined by real-time measurement with, a, with stem psychrometers um, installed in the branches of these trees. And we, so we can see diurnal progressions, that's each of these panels, the diurnal progression in the early drought, late drought of 2015 and uh, following wet season. <clears throat> now, Arisma and Sinatum uh, behaves as a classically isohydric tree. It doesn't matter what environmental conditions do during the day or seasonally throughout the year. It wants to always maintain a constant water potential in its stem. And it does that by regulating the activity of its leaves. Now, Mesilaris itauba, um, it is a more classic anisohydric species. So throughout the day, you can see here water potential decreases. So it's undergoing increasing hydraulic strain as it transpires enough water to create tension in the um, xylem architecture in the tree. And that's kind of mirrored as you go into the late drought scenario here, the entire curve has dropped down to low water potentials and that recovers in the wet season. Um, now, one way to kind of quickly characterize this behavior is by looking at P50. Which is the uh, pers which is um, <laughs> I struggle with how to quickly define this parameter. Uh, basically, you measure the conductivity of water through the uh, branch through the xylem architecture, and you measure the water potential at which it loses fifty percent of its conductivity. So uh, this is kind of a metric of how much hydraulic strain can a tree handle, and it's related to these regulatory strategies you saw on the left. So Arisma can't handle very much hydraulic strain. It has a P50 that's pretty high, negative 1.6. Mesilaris can handle a higher amount of hydraulic strain. Um, and so that's why it has this strategy here. And now the trade-off of being able to handle uh, more hydraulic strain is you tend to have to have smaller xylem vessels or less conductive xylem vessels, which means you can't transpire quite as rapidly. So um, here is a leaf level stomatal conductance diurnal made by Neil Prohaska uh, under reasonably good conditions showing how Arismo and Sinatum is uh, transpiring at about twice the rate of Mesilaris. So that kind of shows the coordination of uh, leaf and stem. And now if you remember this figure I, I showed you earlier depicting plateau and valley species differences in this P50 trait, we saw how the valley species uh, could handle not as much hydraulic strain as the plateau species, and we could infer that they also have a higher conductive capacity. So the mean for these uh, valley species was negative 1.7. That's pretty similar to Erisma, actually. 
So now we can use these two species as models to see what is the potential for ecology, for species composition to influence um, ecosystem scale hydrologic fluxes just through their distinct ecophysiologies. So we, let's imagine that our arisma is a valley forest or a, a representative of the trees in the valley forest and our mesilaurus is representative of uh, more of the strategies on the plateau. And what we did here was we parameterized the T-ribs veggie model, the model that we're going to use for everything in this study, using past ecophysiological measurements conducted mostly by Lauren Albert. And we made artificial forests composed entirely of one species. Um, this is just a test, so don't get excited about how unrealistic this is. <laughs> um, so if we make a, an artificial forest made entirely of arisma, and then we look at transpiration rates, that's what's on the y-axis here through time. This is uh, 45 months of time. And first, actually, let's focus on the green line. That's the actual observed evapotranspiration during this period. So we're using real environmental drivers. And what we get is an incredibly high transpiration, almost twice as much as what we observe if the forests were made entirely of erisma. And if the forests were made entirely of mesilaurus with its more anisohydric strategy, you get much lower transpiration rates, around half of what we actually observe from that forest. And looking on the bottom here, this is what happens in the drainage part of the model. So how much water drains out of the root zone. Pretty quickly when you're running Arisma in the blue, it just starts using up all of the available water and there's no drainage at the root zone. So if we were in one of those plateau valley systems, basically water input to the valleys would be shut off by all of the transpiration from Arisma. Whereas if you had a forest made of Mesilaris, you get significant drainage coming out of the, uh, the plateau system. So this uh, just gives us some, um, it, it shows an example of what is the ecological potential to alter hydrological fluxes just through species compositions and their distinct ecophysiologies. And it looks from this modeling effort that that potential is pretty great. <clears throat> okay, we come to objective two and the rest of these are a little bit uh, shorter. So objective two, uh, our objective is to parameterize the t ribs veggie model for what we call stage one of uh, percolation of soil water into depth. Now, <clears throat> the stage one is is um, the stage one is unique, and I'll show you why. This uh, our primary tool, though, for these observations is deep soil pits, and we have three of these at K67, the the broad plateau site in the east, which is the most of any site in the Amazon, and there's one deep soil pit at kilometer 34. And now this figure shows the problem, why, why this first stage of soil transport um, is challenging to model. So the, this area is made up of clay, very tightly packed clay soil. And if you take a traditional hydrological approach um, that models soil water infiltration and percolation based on soil texture alone, um, this is the pattern that you get. So on this uh, colored figure, we have depth on the y-axis and time on the x-axis covering a uh, couple of weeks of data, I think, and precipitation on this um, figure above. And so basically you get these rainwater inputs. This is following the end of a dry season and they just never make it below one meter because the soil is so tightly packed that water simply doesn't infiltrate. In fact, what you should get is the majority of water runs off. But weirdly, when you're standing on these plateaus and, you, and you're standing there in heavy rains, you don't see runoff. The water doesn't actually pool at all. Somehow it's getting into the soil. <clears throat> in fact, this is what we actually see from the deep soil pit data. This is just, uh, I'm just showing you down to six meters, but we have, I think, down to 10 meters an hour. Um, 
And when we get this precipitation peak here, which is the same as the start of the simulation, we have water propagating rapidly to depth. And it even eventually reaches down to six meters. And as you continue through the wet season, that continues to propagate. So how is it that you have such tightly packed clay soil with um, such rapid infiltration? Well, there's a phenomenon called hybrid hydraulic behavior. Um, and this is where even in tightly packed uh, fine grained soils, you can get rapid water infiltration through macropores. And these macropores are, you know, larger pore spaces in the soil created by either living or dead roots or long decomposed roots, basically anything creating some kind of a gap. And this image here shows where people have poured dyed across the surface, dye across the surface, and then cut out a transect so that you can see how it has managed to infiltrate into depth. Um, and so it's a hybrid behavior because you both have rapid infiltration and you have this matrix act activity of capillary conductivity with a very strong retention of water. And so that uh, dealing with this behavior is necessary in order to both get the drainage out, the, out of the bottom of the root zone that is required to feed hydrology downstream and to get the retention uh, in the root zone that allows water to be available to trees throughout the dry season and late into a drought. <clears throat> and so I'll just say that um, what we're going to do for this objective is use our soil pit data um, for parameterization and validation. And there are several hydrological models available for treating this hybrid hydraulic behavior with different strengths and weaknesses. Essentially, we're gonna see which one works best at our sites um, and kind of install that uh, as this uh, root zone module in the T-ribs veggie. <clears throat> Objective three is to establish the stage two and stage three soil water transport. So that's the uh, deep soil water transport where you're beyond the root zone and we expect that the hybrid hydraulic behavior diminishes because this is now um, much more compacted, simply fine grained soil. Uh, and then of course that ends up going into groundwater and transported laterally out into um, valleys. And the way we're going to do that is first to model it in two dimensions. And there's a very handy two dimensional, real physical two dimensional hill slope transect at K34, where there's a, a nice steady hill slope that uh, grades in toward a stream. And then there are a series of deep wells. That's each of these triangle data points here is where one of the wells is for, for observing water table depth. And then this is the location of uh, their deep soil pit there so that we can monitor soil moisture propagation and changes in water table depth. So we will basically use measurements from here to parameterize and validate the, the subsurface component of T-ribs veggie. And then the final objective is to put all of this together. And um, actually what I, I should have also mentioned in that previous one is um, we're, we're going to use stages or objectives one and two, the upper part of the T-ribs veggie model to parameterize or, uh, the input to the deep soil water in order to develop that stage three. And then that gives you kind of an idea of how the entire integration is going to take place. But now we will have the added challenge of doing all of this in three dimensions. Now this figure, actually maybe I'll just quickly, I'm sharing my whole desktop so I think I can show this video. This video here, may, maybe just concentrate on the left column, shows uh, the three-dimensional dynamics of T-ribs veggie. And we see a couple of slices here where in the upper left, we have infiltration of water and that water is being propagated to deeper layers. And on the lower left, we have the development of the water table. And so you can see kind of the changing in the intensity of the water table that indicates changing in water table depths. As we start to dry out up at the top here, the water table starts to drain to lower levels as well. And then I think we're about to get another pulse. 
And then you see, so I just backed it up, dry up top, low water table, and we get another pulse and that propagates to the deep water table. Um, so that's an example of what that three-dimensional modeling will look like. Oh, this is this is simply a, a simulated system, but what we'll do is incorporate real topography. And then at K34, it is a, as I said, um, the only you know fully hydrologically instrumented watershed in the pristine lowland Amazon. Um, and there's enough instrumentation, including what we are going to add to the site, to fully close the hydrologic budget. So one of the key new outputs that I haven't mentioned yet is stream flow. And that's one good, it's kind of like getting our ecosystem fluxes from the flux tower, getting our stream flow out of the bottom of the, um, the drainage um, combined with all of our other validation measurements at each scale, allow us to close this entire system and see if our whole integrated modeling um, actually works. And of course, so uh, that will involve all of the measurements from both sites, including isolation of the plateau from the K67, our replication of valley dynamics at our new subsite here, and then all of our measurements at K34. This figure on the right just shows an example of um, several of the long-term observations uh, of water table depth from the deep wells that they have, which are not only in that one linear transect, but are distributed throughout the watershed. Uh, enabling us to validate this, these whole watershed water table dynamics um, in three dimensions. So with all of this together, we hopefully will have a functioning model system that can describe the cascade ecohydromics in the Amazon watershed system. And uh, the point is not simply to gain a model that can do this. We have several um, provocative hypotheses that we want to test, but given that this is a proposal that um, is, of course, not even published and not even funded yet, I'm going to withhold some of the interesting questions that we actually want to ask. And if you're dying to know what they might be, then please cross your fingers that we get our funding um, and then stay tuned to see what we come up with. And now, thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, well, thanks very much, Ty. That was a very cool presentation. Um, and so we do actually have some questions in the chat and uh, if you're still formulating your question, uh, you can either, I guess, interrupt me um, after I've asked these first two questions or just go ahead and write them in the chat. Um, so we can start with um, Dr. Koyama's question. Hybrid hydro hydraulic behavior is a fascinating mechanism that water is distributed into deeper soil. How about a role of hydraulic redistribution by roots and hyphae? Um, if you want to go yeah. ahead with that, tie, and if you want to add anything, um, Dr. Koyama, you can uh, chime in. Thanks, Dr. Koyama. Yeah, that is a, it's a super interesting question. It, um, it actually occurred in my earlier cartoons <laughs> for the proposal, and we ended up taking it out to reduce some of the complexity because there are so many components. Um, but actually, I might just defer to Valeri here in terms of how we could model that. Like, I could at least just observe that, that yes, that happens, and that's going to be one of the important ways by which water not only transports vertically downward, but can also be pulled back upward to diffuse into the matrix system. And, it's kind of one of the ways that the trees can continue to uh, rob soil water from its eventual output downstream to those lower forests. Valeria, do you want to add any more detail? Yes, well, so of course, yes, we admit that there is this mechanism and, uh, and it's real. Uh, there was a paper uh, that came out of, I guess, uh, maybe seven or six years ago that actually pulled all the data on hydraulic redistribution showing that in the Amazon region, the landscape is basically uncharted. And what people have, I mean, there is, there, is, uh, there is no empirical evidence, there is no empirical observations of this mechanism to be significant. And even more so, I think specifically at kilometer 67, there was a study where they very convincingly showed that hydraulic redistribution was not a, of significance. Uh, can it be modeled? Yes, it can be modeled. How to parameterize that system is actually pretty tricky. Uh, and I would say that modeler, modeler, modelers here sometimes maybe extend uh, the magnitude of 
uh, of the flux that might be happening. So uh, the bottom line is, uh, I think H or hydraulic redistribution is real. Um, I, we are not focusing on this in this proposal. And I, th I think again, personally, it's just that there is um, a substantial lack of evidence that it's, uh, it's real and it's significant. Great, okay, uh, next question from Rich Kobe. Um, he asked, can deep soil water be accessed by trees? What is the maximum rooting depth and does rooting depth vary with isohydric or anisohydric species? Excellent question. I'm not gonna answer it by the way. <laughs> I could, but. <laughs> if you could, it might help. Yeah, actually, I'm, uh, I could try. Yeah, I go could ahead. try. <laughs> Uh, so this is where <laughs> my postdoc started you know, about 10 years ago. Uh, that was the question number one. And um, when I was looking at kilometer 67, I really tried to pull every possible data set that existed on, uh, you know, for deep soils. So definitely there is a signature of roots going deep down. And what we are seeing is beyond 10 meters, beyond 15 meters, there is life biomass. The quantities of that biomass are of course not very significant, but it's there, which means that it might, it, it probably does have some ecological significance. And um, can they access deep soil water? Absolutely they can. Uh, can, uh, you know, we've, we've done some three-dimensional modeling of root systems where we try to look at how uh, areas with low biomass density, low root biomass density can contribute to the uptake during drought conditions. And it does happen. It does happen. We, there is something that's called a shift of the centroid of uptake. You know, basically if, it, you know, if the surface layer gets too dry, then they can take water from lower or from deeper horizons. Um, is it I mean, what, what is the extent of plasticity of, you know, if you, if you think this is plasticity, I mean, this is something that we, we still don't fully know, uh, or we still don't fully appreciate, so. Um, yeah, I mean, so was it Dan Napstad paper that he um, found deep roots, didn't they excavate and go down to like 12 meters or something? But, 18 I mean, meters, obviously, yes. 18, yes. okay. But obviously, yeah. yeah, those kind of empirical studies are like quite rare in the Amazon, but. And then I think the fan paper found like the depths of roots went down to like 70 meters. That was a global study, but that was kind of mind blowing. But anyway, um, so actually another question uh, back to Dr. Koyama, can you use um, Delta 13 carbon of foliage to gain insight to stomatal limitation to photosynthesis by water for different trees? Also. I guess that's what Marrow did, right? In the well, no, he didn't no, use he didn't. leaf. Um, well, he he looked at uh, water isotopes to infer rooting depth, um, and then he kind of found data to back up the um, the idea that Valeri produced from the modeling effort that there is root niche differentiation by based on tree height. They differentiate rooting depths. Um, but as far as stomatal regulation, I think, uh, I don't know a ton about the uh, isotopic work. I, I know that people do work on that and that that is possible, but I can't really answer any more details than that. Larry, do you know more? It might be, no, a, so, yeah. I mean, so it might no. be a reasonable other approach. What I always find when uh, I have read a little bit about the uh, isotope work is that there always seem to be multiple causes for isotope signatures wherever you measure them um, and it seems to be hard to get a precise answer about a behavior but the same can go i guess for um, making for example spot measurements of uh, stomatal sensitivity to vpd which you know we we just can't go out there and measure uh, 20 species at a subsite get all of these curves and then keep doing them with changing stem water potential for example so, it, I mean, it could be worth looking into other strategies that could give like a more um, comprehensive estimate of the stomatal strategy to make sure that we aren't being kind of uh, tricked by our, our instantaneous measurement conditions. 
I will, I will take that under advisement. Well, um, yeah, please write in your questions in the chat if um, anyone can think of any others. Otherwise, you'll be stuck with questions from me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I had one. I don't know quite how to phrase this, but um, I think it's an interesting question to think about, like, do you have an expectation? Obviously, you think hydrology is important or you wouldn't be writing the proposal. But like, do you have a sense of which stage or even whether the kind of ecological improving the ecological component um, versus the hydrological uh, modeling will be like most important in terms of resolving and improving uh, the model's ability to predict your response variable, which is, is it GPP or what is your response? Well, yeah, we're a uh, good question. We're, we're focused mainly on, we're trying to kind of narrow this to hydrology and as it manifests through uh, ecophysiology and, and influences ecophysiology. So let's say it's impact on evapotranspiration. Um, which one is more important? I feel like that's, it's hard to answer. I mean, if you have in this diagram here, valley forests that are capable of transpiring, you know, twice as much as what you see in the plateau forest, if our simple modeling effort is um, representative of that. And if they're covering 25% of the landscape, um, I mean, it, it may depend on the conditions you're modeling. So if you use a coarse model like uh, Migas, Macho, and Fan, and you try to model the K34 area in which, you know, their hydrologic output produces no shallow water tables, so you would get none of these uh, dynamics from this 25% of the forest down here, um, then you, and you tried to progress the forest through an El Nino drought, then you might get significant drainage and all of the forests kind of starting to shut down. Whereas um, the groundwater more likely would allow that 25% of the forest to transpire at very high rates. If they transpire twice the rate of the plateau, then it would be um, about half the transpiration on the landscape. And while the plateau shuts down, these would keep going and so, you would, you would definitely need the hydrology in order to see any transpiration from that landscape at all. And so let's say maybe then hydrology is more important so that you can get any transpiration. And then if you wanna get the magnitude right, then you need the ecology. So maybe that would lean us toward yeah, resolving the hydrology. But I also maybe will just take this opportunity to <clears throat> say something that I hadn't addressed, which I thought people might ask, which is, you know, if we can, sure, use this fine scale, highly detailed model to resolve these dynamics over small spatial scales, but how do we go back up to kind of, to get to the scale that I introduced of, you know, dynamic vegetation models and earth system models that do operate at larger grid scales? And one of the objectives that we have is once we resolve the, the processes that are relevant here and the outcomes of those processes. We anticipate kind of identifying regions, subregions of characteristic behavior um, within the landscape in terms of hydrological and ecological behavior. And then we anticipate that there are simpler predictors of those behaviors. We kind of have to run the full process to see how they emerge. But then we think that there will be, there are landscape features such as the ratio of recharge zones to a uh, given, a recharge zone area to a given discharge zone um, and the height of that recharge zone relative to the discharge zone. These things can be simpler predictors that we can get from uh, topography and maybe simpler hydrology modeling that we could apply across broader landscapes without doing the detailed modeling of those landscapes. And in that way, we may be able to actually simplify and say, well, here's a histogram of the relative abundances of these subunits of characteristic behavior that occur within this grid cell. And you can use this to scale up. Yeah, I like that idea. Okay, well, we don't appear to have any more questions. Um, if you guys don't have anything else to add, um, probably wrap up. Well, thanks so much for a great presentation, Ty, and for, yeah, for, to both you and Valeri for joining us. Um, sharing your your um, proposal. We very much hope it gets funded. <laughs> and um, thank you to everybody um, who joined um, this Hanover sem seminar. Um, I don't know if Lauren or Renee could remind us when the next one is, um, but um, if not, you will uh, have emails uh, so you can uh, tune in for the next one.
Great. Thanks, Marielle. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending and for your questions. Likewise. Thanks, everybody.